Hi, my name is Amaria Ackerson, and I'm a sophomore mass communication major at Xavier University, Louisiana. And my question goes out to everybody who is listening to me. Um, one of my biggest things about um, learning about black education and just all types of education across the races, demographics, and intersectionalities is how important you guys think non-traditional forms of education, like Studio B, like the work that you guys put in, and what is the impact on on what the work you do and how you choose to impact our universe because this is a really big deal and non-traditional media is so much, almost arguably more important than what we learn inside of our schools because there's so much that we don't learn. So can you guys kind of just delve more into that and your individual impact in that? Good question, thank I, you. I wonder if, if, I mean, when I think about that, you know, one of the great joys of the work that I get to do is that I'm learning all the time. And one of the great joys of being a human being on Earth is that you get to learn all the time, even after you leave school. And the things I think we learn outside of school often are more powerful for us or more lasting. And I think just if, if Nicole, you wanted to say some words, I mean, to me, there's stuff in the 1619 Project that, like, I know I've had conversations with relatives or, like, my mm -hmm. parents about, like, I didn't know that, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, you, like, at any age, you can come to the reality of... It's a big country with a big, long history. And even without the sort of omissions, there'd be stuff we miss. But I think that's been this sort of process of lifelong learning. The fact that there's a thirst for it in, that as representative of the demand for the 1619 Project, to me, has been a big part of the story. I always tell a student who is uh, a student at an HBCU by how you introduce yourself. You always <laughs> represent well. Yeah, that is true. Um, I mean, I would agree with you and argue that most of what we know about American history or how we come to understand our society, we don't learn in school. It's who do we build monuments to? Who do we name streets after? Who do we make movies about, right? It's, it's when we go into a museum, who are the paintings of? That's why a place like this is so important and so subversive, because it's centering different people that we don't usually see in an artistic space. So uh, all of that is critical, and that is what, right? The, most of what I know about our history, I didn't learn in school, I learned in self-study. And I think the, the pushback on the 1619 Project is also an understanding that it's popular media, that it's other forms of learning that is much more powerful and much has much more potential to shape our kind of collective understanding. So yes, um, I agree, though, we also need to do a much better job of teaching this in schools. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> we, can't, uh, we can't seed that ground because that is where the structured learning occurs that kind of provides the roadmap. And, and when you start to see the real attacks against the 1619 Project, it's once it became clear that educators were using it in the classroom, yes. uh -huh. that that was considered the danger. And of course, that's where the whole anti-critical race theory propaganda came, uh -huh. um, is not wanting our children in schools to get a better understanding, because when you have a better understanding, um, you support different policies. And you, um, well, you would create a more equal world, which of course people don't want, so. Uh -huh. We have one more right here. Pardon me, sir. Hi, thank you. My name is Bettina Brokamp. Um, I am a st graduate student at the University of Southern Mississippi. I study marine science with a focus on physical oceanography. Um, my question is, as I go through my life in increasing o o ocean literacy and understanding um, the impacts that climate change is going to have, particularly on the black community, I want to know what you all think about how we can approach the the, the topic of uh, climate gentrification and what that's going to look like for the black community and how we can have these conversations that are impactful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good question. Solid? A solid? I think it's, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So um, I just had the honor and privilege of bringing 20 artists and activists from New Orleans and the surrounding region to the climate um, conference in Sharm el-Sheikh 
in um, November. And the reason that we went is because none of our elected officials were going, right? There is nobody who is representing us on um, a level of true leadership and authority and decision-making around these issues that are sounding the alarm around the fact that New Orleans is disappearing, that we have a very short amount of time to make radical changes, and that if we don't, not just New Orleans, but all of the land that we protect, uh, um, the whole southeast of the United States, right, um, is going to be disappearing. I had to hit New Orleans and it hit Brooklyn at the same time. Um, and I, our entire country needs to come to grips around climate justice and its impacts. And they can't begin to think that just because you placed all of the poison in black communities, that that's where it's going to stay, mm, right? right. It, th that, that's just yes. not how it's going to work. It's not how the world works. And until we get climate justice under control, we will not get climate impacts under control. Yeah, we're This is a, Asali, thank you, that's right. This is an area where the Biden administration has stepped up. Just recently, as you know, aside from the infrastructure bill on top of that, they passed the Inflation Reduction Act. And in that bill is the largest investment in climate action in the history of America. There's an equity lens on all of this money that's gone out the door. So between the infrastructure bill, which is also clean air, clean water. So Michael Regan, who is the administrator of the EPA, on top of the work that Lisa Jackson did, who, by the way, is from here and is from Zav is a Xavier University graduate, clean air and clean water, getting rid of lead and lead pipes all over the country is critically important. Cleaning up brown fields, cleaning up orphan wells, cleaning up abandoned mine lands that are mostly in communities of color, making sure, for example, I was in Lowndes County just a couple of weeks ago uh, with Catherine Flowers, making sure, because there are folks in this country that don't have access to indoor plumbing. There are two million people, and there's money in the bill to do that. And then on the resilient side of it that Asali's talking about. Now, you can put Louisiana in the mix, or you can put California in the mix right now with no water, or you can put the middle of the country together with tornadoes, or you can put what's going on uh, in in, in New York because they forgot a long time ago when Katrina hit that they could get hit by Sandy too. And you start thinking about the impact on communities of color. There is a specific focus on making sure that that money gets to the ground in a way that helps communities that have been hurt the most. And one of them is about clean air and clean water. And Michael Regan, who's the head of EPA, who's from North Carolina, as a matter of fact, has been leading that effort and has been down here many times, quite frankly, and focusing on those efforts as well. Um, I, I, think, we, I think, yeah, we want to just... Was, one yeah. More? No. Um, I want. I wanted to thank you all for uh, being part of this tonight. It was mm -hmm. incredibly special to be down here in this incredible city with all of your lovely faces looking back at us, <laughs> intent and attentive, and uh, just giving off incredible energy um, in very, very uh, fraught and perilous times. But it was really like very, very special to be in this room with all of you. So I just want to thank you all for being here. With us. And, and before we go, can we just please? Have one more hand for B Mike, and can you stand up? Yeah. And I want to. For creating this space, and it's I wanna, very special. And finally, before we let you all go, I just want to thank the Kellogg Foundation that sponsored this evening and for bringing us all together. And have a wonderful night. We're gonna, have we're a great night. For more New Orleans trips. Yes, all right? more New Orleans. Thank you all. Yeah, I'm <laughs>